You're welcome along to the Keith Andrews Show. Uh, we've got loads to get through this week. Joining me yet again by popular demand is Joe. <laughs> by popular demand by yeah. who? No one else is available. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Very popular demand. How are you? Yeah, great. Good to be with you. How's the week? Yeah, really well. Good. Really well. You've had Kenny in for a couple of nights, haven't you? It's funny, when you've Kenny in for a Tuesday and a Wednesday, you kind of come in Thursday a bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? It's just full on, that man. He never seems to tire, yeah. slow down, He's stop like talking. home. We had that conversation the other day. I mean, I just... Um, With Kenny? No. Oh, back, yeah. back, obviously. <laughs> he doesn't have the internet. <laughs> but, I mean, we have talked in the office about, does he ever have an off moment? Because I'm not so sure he does. He just comes in yeah. and it's like Full tornado of, of energy. Yeah. All right, lads. Ooh, oh, uh. yeah, yeah. And then he's on air and it's three hours of non-stop talking yeah. during the ad breaks and on air. Yeah. Like, there's no difference with Kenny off air and on no, air. No, there's not. I think people should realise that. Um, so what, what did I hear about a rowing challenge? Well... Um, You're up for it, by the way, I've heard. Vaguely up for it. Kenny was in in short, and we were doing a competition for sports gear. McSport.ie was the um, competition. Good and um, we just mentioned all the gear they have, including rowing machines. And on air, Kenny starts going, no, no, I'm trying to promote these things. <laughs> <laughs> he just talked about his hatred of rowing machines. So I don't know if you had something yeah, like that Yeah, when you're injured, it's, it's not a nice one. Well, he said it was just one of those things, like you do circuits and various bits and bobs. Yeah. He said the rowing machine, he said it's brilliant for you, it works everything, and it's great, yeah. but mental... Torture. Yeah, it's just, a tough one. Yeah. Just grim. He said so. He said he can't. He says he goes to the gym now. He can't even look at a rowing machine. So the good people at McSport he got back onto us and said, mm. if you two want to do a rowing challenge against each other, we would facilitate that. Okay. So I mean, look, I said I was vaguely open. To Kenny it. was just no. Kenny said absolutely not. I'm not doing that. And we're talking eight minutes of rowing here. It's first to two k. They reckon that could be eight to nine yeah, minutes yeah. of hard rowing, but he says no. I'd do that. <laughs> Oh, I mean, you can... We have a three-way? <laughs> yeah. What? Uh, we can, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you can convince Kenny to do it, then we can have a three-way. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> okay, let's have a little look what we've got coming up today. Champions League chat, we'll discuss Liverpool. Man United's come back last night and also Spurs. The Ireland under-21s manager job available. A little bit of speculation as to who's going to exactly get that. Premier League relegation scrap after 11 games. Who's going to struggle? Who's going to be getting cleared out in the coming weeks? We've also got Stephen Reid on, who's been a little bit... In the, in the quiet zone for the last few months after leaving Crystal Palace. So I'll be interested to see how Stephen's been getting on. And then we're going to talk about derbies. Man U, Man City this weekend. And I'm at Sheffield United versus Sheffield Wednesday tomorrow, which I'm really looking forward to. So to bring us into the Champions League chat, speaking on Virgin Media Sport last night, Graham Sooners and Mick McCarthy discussed Juventus' substitutions. Allegri has a lot to answer for and he'll get absolutely hammered in the Italian press because they're, you know, everything's about tactics in Italy. And his, his Bazzaglia, his substitution by bringing Bazzaglia on, is, is why, have, why has he done that? Because he's good in the air and he's a big old boy and he'll attack things because they've got Fellaini on. And that momentum shift then was enormous. That was an invitation for Man United to go long. And all of a sudden, instead of, and it's subconscious when you're in a game like that, you've got the ball, there's five minutes to go or ten minutes to go, and all of a sudden, you're not running forward to accept it. You might be standing still. You might be taking a step backwards. And the whole momentum, the whole thing shifted. Mm. And that substitution when they brought Bizagli on for me. And, well, and, and obviously, Fellini. Well, they put Quadrado at right wing back. Who had had a good game. Who had had a good game. Yeah. They, they, weren't under, they weren't under a great, great deal of pressure when he made that substitution. Virgin Media Sport is the new home of European football in Ireland with more than 400 UEFA Champions League, Europa League and Nations League games live this season. Virgin Media Sport is exclusive to all Virgin Media TV customers who can also download the TV anywhere app and stream it, all the action whenever and wherever they like. I think you're doing about 300 of those games, are you? <laughs> no, not quite. Not, I'm not doing as many as Kev. No, <laughs> no well, nobody's doing as many as Kev. Um, I listened to the football show coming in this morning. Kenny was in the studio, obviously. Yeah. Um, Graham's there making the point. I know you were talking to Kenny about it last night. Graham's making the point about the substitution, Bars Agli. Mm. I, I didn't particularly have a problem with it. And I, and, I, and I thought, and it surprised me his comments, that considering he's spent time in Italy, he's obviously seeing Italian teams down through the age, going defensive mind in the last 10, 15 minutes, not a real issue seeing them, yeah. seeing them out. I was listening to Martin Keown commentating, and he said it straight away. And he was right in terms of the way the momentum had shifted. But it was more. I thought it was more so what... Man United did with bringing Fellaini and Mata on, obviously Mata with the with the goals, but I thought they reacted to bringing Fellaini on, knowing that United would go a little bit more direct by bringing Barzagli on. And he brought him on at Old Trafford a couple of weeks ago and seeing the game out mm. fairly comfortably at Old Trafford. Yeah. But I did think it was a bit of a momentum swing, mainly 
from Fellaini coming on and doing his usual um, nuisance job, which I did think he did very, very well. Yeah, there's no doubt. I think Manchester United fans might be in two minds about this result. It's a fantastic win, and there's no doubt. And you go to Turin, and since they won in 03, remember Giggs scored that amazing goal? Yeah. Juventus have only lost once at home in the Champions League. They've a magnificent record Since there. then, yeah. once. So now of their three defeats in Turin in the last 15 years, yeah. two of them are Manchester United. So it's an amazing result, and it's a big fill-up for the team and the general mood of things. By the same token, I mean, Juventus had 55% possession. They had 23 shots to mm. Manchester United's eight. They bossed the game. Cudrado scored it, should have scored that chance. Dybala hit the crossbar. I mean, they bossed the game mm. again, really. But I thought, I thought you, I thought Man U looked a lot more comfortable than they did. Certainly the first half at Old Trafford. Mm. I thought Juventus' first half a couple of weeks ago was the best 45 minutes I'd seen in Europe this yeah. year. I thought they were that impressive. Yeah. I really did. United were all over the place, and they were just in the midst of coming back through this tricky spell of the the West Ham game. And but since then, they've they've been on a good run. They have, you know. Is that where you were going with that point about Man United fans will be a little bit mixed? Well. I mean, there's just a point. So, like, I was reading Jamie Jackson in The Guardian mm. talking about Fellaini and Mata coming on. Mata, you've no real problem with coming on. Although Kenny's argument last night was, like, why not start Mata? Why not try and be a bit more I creative? But I thought he made a mistake in the first game by playing Mata because I thought they got overran in midfield. Doesn't have the legs. So I thought yeah. it was the right decision. Okay, fair enough. Actually. You know, that's interesting. But look, there is a point where, you know, so in The Guardian, instead Mourinho refused to buckle. He threw on the pairing of Mata and Fellaini with 11 minutes re remaining. It proved a masterstroke. Like, there is a point with Good United effort. where you look at all the... T I mean, a masterstroke, I mean, like, oh. in fairness. There is a point with United where you have to wonder if for all the money spent and all the brilliant players they have, mm. like, it still just does boil down to throwing the big lad on and pumping the ball yeah, up. Yeah, la last night, Joe, I, didn't, I certainly didn't have a problem with that against a really good side like Juventus. My argument with that would traditionally be that has been the plan B, hasn't it? Where they play in a certain way, which we don't really know what way that is. We know the way Liverpool play, although that has changed this year. We know the way Manchester City, we know the way Sarri plays at, at Chelsea. We don't know what way Jose Mourinho's Manchester United. They haven't really got a style where you'd say, well, that's the way they try and play football. It's not with massive width with Martial or Rashford's keeping the width or narrow forwards like Liverpool, etc. Mm. And plan B has always been, even against the lesser teams in the Premier League, let's get Flaney on. And I've always said, that is not good enough no. for Mourinho, for Manchester United and the players he had. But last night, so I'm coming here this morning, I'm going, I'm going to have to kind of eat my words about Fellaini because constantly I've been criticising him coming on as the saviour. Yeah. But last night I didn't have a problem with it. Even with 10 minutes to go, I thought, yeah, do we? Totally fair enough last night. But my, my, just my point is, this cannot be the blueprint. I agree. You know what I mean? I, yeah. Like against Bournemouth when they're one all, mm. if it's Fellaini on, like really. And, you know, I think the, the, the most telling thing about Mourinho is still that, what is the best team? Mm. So what's the best back for? Can any Manchester United fan answer that? What is the guaranteed go-to back mm. four? What's the best midfield three? No one knows. No. And what's the best front three? So he doesn't yeah. actually know a single line of his team. Yeah. The only and, one he knows is the hair. And you could say, look, Lindelof is doing a better job now and he's in increasingly. But like one bad game and he'll be back out. Yeah. And it could be McTominay in a yeah. back five. Yeah. So you kind of think three years in, what's the best team? You compare yeah. that with the very best teams like Liverpool. You can reel off the Liverpool best mm. team, give or take, every time. There's a consistency mm. about it and a momentum about it. Like still, look, it's a fantastic result. And it's a good run they're going on. Since that 3-2 win over Newcastle where they came back yeah. early parts of October, Chelsea 2-2 two, two away, lost home to Juve in that game we've already mentioned. Then they've beat Juve, sorry, Everton and Bournemouth. Yeah. Um, Bournemouth away, came back again, and last night. Yeah. So I think there's signs of it. The whole Rashford, um, Martial debate. The Martial debate is just comical because he... He is an outstanding well, goal that I'm not, I've, I, would, I would imagine in the last two to three transfer windows, Manchester United have fended off some serious interest in him from other clubs. And Mourinho would have sold him. There is no yeah. doubt that's been reported yeah. unequivocally. And like the list of players that Mourinho has burnt. I mean, you're even looking at Quadrado last night and you're thinking, there's another one. Yeah. I mean, he's got through a fair amount of yeah. talent, Mourinho, and discarded it. Like you kind of wonder with Martial. Here's a question for you. You look at Raheem Sterling. Mm. Where would Martial be? If he had been Guardiola. working under Guardiola for yeah. the last three years. I, I totally agree with you, John. Totally agree with you, which is when it goes back to January. And the reason that Alexis Sanchez signed for Manchester United was purely financial. Fact. Yeah. Same city. <laughs> Can't even use the geographical one. Can't even use the sunshine. Oh, I want to stay in London. I want to go to Madrid or Paris or whatever yeah. it was. Same city, two totally different managers. And if they're footballing reasons, you're going to Manchester City. And I totally agree about the Sterling. 
Martial is a mm. good reference point because the way them two have gone, Martial's shown glimpses because he's a Mourinho. Oh, he'd be Luke Shaw. He'd be at Bournemouth, too, wasn't he? He'd be at Bournemouth. Now, he? <laughs> yeah, he really, he would have to resurrect his career. And again, look, I mean, even Mourinho at the end, this fantastic result, like this really big night for the club. And I don't know, look, people can dismiss the traditions and the, the Manchester United way. I totally get that it's a little bit, yeah, a little bit sickly. But there were moments of class about the club. Mm. There really were under Ferguson. He had his bad moments too. But when you've won, at least be a gracious winner. I and Mourinho going on and though, confronting Benucci and like Graeme Souness summed it up last night. He always finds a way to make it about himself. Yeah. And Souness was arguing, why not celebrate with your backroom staff that huge win and go on and high five the players yeah. and actually have a feeling of goodwill yeah. around? Instead, it's this toxic element that he introduces. I did hear Mick coming back with a good line to Graham. Though, didn't you plant a flag in the middle of a pitch in Istanbul? Look, that one could be leveled no. to Souness. But in fairness to Souness, <laughs> he wasn't in that every week. Whereas this is every week. Yeah, right? I know. It's it's it. Look, it's it's, it's, it's just a, Mourinho. It's a fantastic That's result. It. It's an amazing result. But I I would just ask you. I mean, you're. Obviously, you've got to feel for these things more than I would, but I'm, I, I don't feel it's a massive corner turned. No, I, 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 I don't think I'd be sitting here in January and I would bet you my house that he won't be playing five at the back with McAtamney again. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Kind of. And the reason I'm pointing out that little run that this side yeah. is on and it has got better and the, there, there are more positive signs is because when you go back to that time, I thought he was done and dusted. I really did because it was toxic. Right, the, new the whole atmosphere, time. yeah. Mm. Like before that and the, the, the manner of the defeat and all the stuff that was creeping out and just his general demeanour, it was at an all-time low. So that's my point. I do think they've torn the car, but I agree, last night, it's not as if you're kind of going, that's it That's now. the formula. That's it. That's the point, yeah. Because it, you're right, it's, it's, it's certainly not a, a masterstroke. It's not, it's needs must, it's oh, what can we do? And it's, yeah, the big it's, it's Fellaini. The one thing I'd ask you then, so around that Newcastle time, the players have kept playing for him. Yeah, they you have. Know, like when, yeah. when I kind of level all the stuff where the concerns and the issues you'd have with Mourinho and Manchester United and where it's going, the players have not down tools at all. And last night they couldn't have worked mm. harder. So I think there's maybe been a change in the last couple of weeks, two three weeks, maybe a little bit more of a relaxed atmosphere. I I I, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing because yeah. they look like they're playing with a little bit more freedom. They look like they're playing with a little bit more belief. Tactically, I don't think too much has changed. Maybe barring Lukaku being out of the side and having more of a mobile front three. Yeah. But I do think they have been better and there has been a kind of little bit more relaxed feel about the players in the last few weeks, yeah. whether that's directly down to him or players getting together and saying, look, let's just put that to one side. This is embarrassing. We're, 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 you know, we're getting Maybe. It'd be interesting to see where it goes. Before you leave that game, I mean, you have to talk about the Ronaldo goal. Oh, fuck. <laughs> you don't drop an F bomb. No, yeah. talk about it. <laughs> What's a goal? What's a goal? I was at home watching it. <laughs> I mean, did I say that? That's out loud? all we need to say. Oh, fuck. I was watching it at home and I didn't see it live. And then my uh, sister's, uh, my uh, wife's sister's over with a fella, and he was just like, "Wow!" <laughs> well, I was like, literally, like. What's going on here? Seeing the replay. First of all, I seen him produce his the 12 apps. pack yeah. and I was like, oh, get off me telly. Then I was just like, wow, is right. That is a phenomenal goal. Phenomenal. He didn't even look and he's buried it past the hair. Mm. God, what a goal. Everything about it. Because um, he makes the little run and that sends Lindelof back, so he's not, he's not going to be offside, yeah. and then he gets a proper ah, run on him. So it, quality. He, like, you never talk quality. on the many, many things you talk about Ronaldo. Bottom of the list, because it's the least exciting thing to talk about, the timing of his yeah, runs. Yeah, yeah. Like he did, yeah. he, he made a move, then Lindelof had to go back. Had to go back and then, and then he knows, I'm on side now, I've got you. Yeah. I've got you in front of me and I, and I can take and off. Joe, even you. when it lands, like, how many other players produce that? They, might, they do well to get on target. Never mind. And he didn't even smash it. He just met it clean. Over shot, not even looking where the head of the goal is. Just yeah. knows the area of the pitch that he's in and flies past You know what struck me in the replay as well? I mean, look, it's, diff it's a difficult skill no matter what, but even this ball, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't one of those ones that's hit straight with backspin. Mm. It was actually curled in yeah. right to left. Yeah. So there's an extra little bit of having to get Swazzle. the flight of this ball, you know? And I was thinking of that program a couple of years ago where Ronaldo does all these tests where, like, someone hits a corner and they turn off the lights. Uh, did you see that show? No. They did this thing a couple of years ago. I mean, it was PR guff, ultimately, right. but they did different things, Ronaldo doing different skill tests, and one of them was... You know, his ability just by seeing, you could do it. I mean, mere mortals couldn't, right. but anyone who's played at your level could very easily, I'm sure. 
just so he'd have someone take a corner and he's yeah. in the penalty box. It's in a studio, so they can oh, control the Oh, I've read lights. about this. I didn't yeah. see it. Yeah. So guy takes the corner, and as soon as he kicks the ball, lights go off. The lights go off. Yeah. And just by the body shape and the way he's seen connection with the ball, Ronaldo can judge the fight of the ball. So all you have is darkness. Right. And then you just hear, bang. And then you hear the net ripple. Really? Yeah. And then you get to watch it back. Consistently. I don't know how many times they did it actually, right. but then you get to watch it back with the night vision cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's not the cleanest strike Ronaldo's ever had, yeah. but it's still not bad. Yeah. And it made me think of that last night that yeah. he looked over his shoulder, saw the kick, yeah. and he's half watching the ball, it's and phenomenal. it's just phenomenal. Yeah, phenomenal. Uh, Spurs struggle, but got there. They, um, I've got a lot of sympathy for Spurs actually, I really do. But the whole contract situation of players, the stadium dilemma. Um, the manager getting linked to Real Madrid, how serious? I'm not, not quite sure. But mm. players-wise, they all they've really lost in the last couple of years is Kyle Walker. I thought there'd be a lot more, and there's a lot being made about players not coming in in the summer, which undoubtedly has a has an impact. Um, the pitch is a disgrace after that game against um, the NFL game they played mm. the day after against Man City, and because that game got brought back because of the NFL game, not in their new stadium, they have to end up playing four games in eight days in three different competitions. I feel for them because I think in Daniel Lever they've got someone as as good as there is in that area of expertise it's at football clubs. Levy is derided, you know, I don't, as being yeah, I don't I think he's doing a good job. Yeah. I really do. I think he's trying to move the club on, but I think the unfortunate aspect of it is the timing of this stadium mm. is at a time where they've had the best side or the nucleus of a side squad that they could have done something really special with it yeah. but they haven't been able to add to that because of the stadium in the background and the financial mm. implications they have to balance the books they can't be silly with it like we've seen Arsenal go into the Emirates and for years they had to just sell yeah. sell so I feel really really sorry for them and I think Pochettino is doing as well as he can in the predicament he finds himself. And I feel for some of the players because the younger ones, maybe not so much because they've got time on their hands. Mm. But if you look at someone like Alderweireld, Ericsson to a degree, late 20s, you want to be financially rewarded for how good you are yeah. and comparatively what that level of player is getting elsewhere. So Raheem Sterling, 300 grand a week, reportedly at Man City. Deli Ali signs him for 100 grand a week. Don't think there's that much of it no. between them. Ericsson, Alderweireld, I've already mentioned. You want to win medals, Joe. You no. want to win trophies. And, and you, you get into that stage in your career. Like Deli Ali's all right because he's got another 10 years plus mm. at, a, at a, the top level. Yeah, you do get the sense with Spurs that they've had quite a rare thing in football in the last couple of years whereby they've recognised this is quite a good thing. Mm. We've got a good manager. White Hart Lane's a great stadium. Good group of players. Mm. No big egos. Even our best player, Harry Kane, can set a tone by yeah. not being greedy and yeah. not wanting away. Yeah. And actually, we're improving and Champions League and pushing for the league. And almost the Ericsson types, their late 20s, have sort of said, OK, look, an extra 50 grand a week would be nice. But yeah. you know what? Maybe maybe this is kind of something special. Mm. And you do sense that that has been chipped away at in the last has. six months. And so... I think he's constantly putting fires out. I think he's yes, been brilliant, yeah, yeah. Pochettino. I really do. He, he adheres to what's going on above and tries to keep that relationship as good as it can be with, with Daniel Levy and the, and the hierarchy. And then also, can you imagine what's going on like day to day? Players being players know what everybody else is on. They remember, don't play England together. Yeah. They know what's going on with other clubs. Well, remember Danny Rose came out and said, we're being underpaid yeah. as crap. I mean, the concrete reports were when Danny Rose came back into the dressing room, he got a standing ovation. They all started saying, good on you yeah. for saying it, you know? Like, I guess the worry for, the, the worst case scenario for Spurs fans is, Pochettino says, look, I can't, I can't keep hanging around this for much mm. longer and gets an offer he can't refuse. Maybe it's Madrid, maybe it's mm. not. And then once one or two players goes, it could be a house of cards situation. Oh, snowballs. Big time. I totally agree. Totally agree. But yeah, but look, they, they got the win. They're still in, you know, it's got an uphill task. It's still going to be very unlikely that they, they get through. But I just think, look, that's where you are right now. I don't think you can expect much more. But having said that, should have beaten Inter match day one. We're in pole position, two late goals. Should have beaten PSV two weeks ago in Nijnhoven. So they should be five mm. points better off than what they are. It's um, a pity because actually they're probably never going to win the league this year, especially no. given the lack of recruitment. But their best 13 players were capable of having a crack at the Champions oh, League. I agree, yeah. 13, 14 that players, yeah. Been, you know, that would have made it a great season. Yeah, exactly. But, there where they are, top four will be a good achievement. Mm. Uh, quickly on Liverpool, I think he's going to get criticised 
and has been criticised for his team selection. I didn't have so much of it. Okay. We differed in the studio. Then I myself, Kevin and Graham Sooners. Graham Sooners in particular thought he should have played his strongest team. My thought process was that Matip coming in was a mistake because I think Gomez and Van Dijk are forging a really good partnership and I think at the back there's different types of energy levels. You don't sprint as much, you don't use as much energy in, as, you, as you do in those forward areas. So Lallana and Sturridge coming in I didn't have a problem with. Mm. Having said that, I thought Sturridge was poor, really, really poor. I was thinking here's your opportunity. We've seen Shakiri in recent weeks who wasn't brought. Again, I agreed with that decision. Can't go then in hindsight and go, well he should have, they needed him. Mm. Um, Sturridge was really poor, really, really poor. Surely to God now he realises what is the minimum requirement playing in a front three for Liverpool in terms of energy levels? Yeah. And he was strolling. The really? lot he made about was miss. Should have put them one 0 ahead. Really, really good opportunity. Didn't. I've got a problem with that. That happens. Strolling. Was he? That's surprising because so much of the. I mean, I was in here, so I didn't see it that closely. Yeah, it's hard when you're in here, isn't it? So much of the talk was that Sturridge had seen the light over the summer. Mm. Oh, I think he's been brilliant this yeah. season. That's why. That's what I'm getting at. I think he deserved his start. And Lalana coming back gives them something different in midfield. So mm. played alongside mm. one Aldam and, and Milner. No problem with that. But they just like they've come from seven wins in a row at the start of the season now. That's three wins in their last nine. So look, there's a lot being made about the style of play, the way they've changed it. I'm amazed how much it's changed compared to last season, to what we're seeing now from Liverpool. Even in those first seven games, it was nowhere near the level of no. what we seen last season at their best. It's just such a difference to what well, we've seen. Can you put? Because I'm, I'm quite confused. Can you uh, defensively? They've now transformed. It's fantastic. Yeah, um, a lot can more you, solid. Can you put your finger on why that front three and the attacking game isn't clicking as much? Well, I think the front. Well, the whole team isn't as open, isn't as explosive, isn't as dynamic. Yeah. Which has a knock-on effect for the front for the front three because there's more of a pragmatic approach at times in the way they play, more conservative, mm. and also they set the bar that high last year. Especially Salah, too yeah. much is getting made yeah, yeah. of him, but it's definitely not coming off to the levels it did last year for him in particular. Firmino as well, actually, which he looks tired. A little bit, maybe, yeah. But I did think he made a difference coming on uh, storage, even even off the ball, like just tracing back, carrying back, setting mm. the tone. Like he was the one last year really that set the tone, wasn't he? And mm. the others kind of joined in and got, and got around that. But yeah, it's it's difficult. Uh, I want to move on to the Ireland yes. Twenty Ones manager jobs come available. It's been a lot made. Uh, there was a piece today in the Herald, Aidan Fitzmaurice, Lee Carsley in the frame for the under 21s job. I think he would be a magnificent appointment. I really do. We've got Stephen Reid joining us in a while. Again, him into that equation. Ideally, I think it would be an ex player or some ex player part of the, the process. But when you look at those two in particular, and I would chuck Damien Duff into that equation as well. Who, the ex-players that have taken their coaching very, very seriously, it can't just be an ex-player for ex-players' sake. Yeah. That, that's just ridiculous. That just doesn't work. So you've got to identify who has done what at what level. Mm. Lee Carsley, well involved with the FA in England. He's coached at Brentford. He's coached at, at Birmingham. Um, Man City. Highly regarded Man City's academy, yeah. Um, I didn't realise, actually, I must confess, because it's hard to keep track of everything, I didn't realise how highly regarded Carsley was until Kev, until Kev started working on the show. All oh, right, As a coach in general, you mean? Yes. Yeah. And as an underage coach, yeah. all that he's done, because it's, me, it's just it's underage football, so you're not seeing everything, and just how highly regarded he is within the FA, to the point where I wonder, actually, if he'd even be interested in the, in the I don't show. think we'll get him. I genuinely don't think he's we'll up, get him. He's above it. In but it, I, in I, I would side. suggest so, yeah. um, but I would, I would also suggest it's a bit of a missed opportunity because if you can recognise someone's a very good coach like that, mm. like him, like Stephen Reid is, but you, you listen to players and the managers that Stephen Reid, and we'll speak to him about it in a little yeah. bit, who he's worked with, the likes of Roy Hodgson, Yap Stam, Steve Clark, he's been in there for a few years. He, he's out of work at the moment by choice, I should say, because he left Crystal Palace at the end of the season. Again, he does little bits and bobs with the FA. Can we get in there and maybe do something like that. But I think Lee Carsley is probably out of our reach, I agree. But that's that's the bar we need to be going at. Yeah, I've seen Robbie, we need to... Robbie Keane's been talked about a lot, but I don't think he's started his pro licence yet. No, he hasn't started his pro licence. I think he starts in January, um, if memory serves me right. Like obviously his time will come, Yeah, but I just wonder if that might be a bit premature. Like if you want to get someone in who's a bit more experienced. But the experience factors, I'm working with players in and around that age as well, yeah. which Lee Carsley has in abundance mm. with the FA. Mm. 
you know, it's it, this. This is where we need, we need to be pitching at this type of level. Mm. I know there's a new influx. I, I did it a few years ago. Kenny did it with the underage teams. Um, there's a new influx now of the likes of uh, Andy Reid, Sean Saint Ledger, Richard Dunn's involved. Mark Kitzel has been working with. Yeah, Mark's team. been involved. Again, I don't I don't really know too much about yeah. what Mark's done coaching wise. I know he was involved with Roddy United as well, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, but all I know is about you. You so you weren't aware about Lee Carsley. Well. Any, if there's good coaches in the game, you hear about it because word of mouth spreads. Yeah. Players talk, players talk to agents, players talk to other players, players talk to other coaches, and it gets around so quickly. Mm. Like Steve McLaren, as a prime example, years and years ago, had an unbelievable reputation as a coach. Mm. It just goes. And Lee Carsey has that. It's fantastic, yeah, yeah. And so, like, I mean, you and Kenny were involved briefly. Mm. Briefly being the operative word here, why is that not a long-term thing? Like why, so Kenny did a stint where he was, he wasn't the manager with them, mm. the 19s, but he was there as a sounding board and blah, blah, blah. So like, where's the long-term plan? Go in, do a little bit so I don't know what happened there. I don't know if there was a falling out or if it just ran to a natural end or if Kenny had other things going on. But why is it not like, well, okay, do a year with the 19s manager, then do the 16s manager, then do the 21s manager. Yeah. And the same with you. I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but no, I'm I saw you guys going in and then you're back out. And I'm well, so what's the strategy? Well, I don't plan? know with, Pen, uh, with Kenny, but in my particular case, it was very much I took a year out um, after leaving MK Dons as the first team coach. I uh, was on the pro license, was on a course in England as well. I started to do a little bit, a little more media. Um, and I worked with the 16s, 17s primarily, and 18s. Mm and enjoyed my time and wanted to stay involved and for one reason or another it didn't particularly happen. You know, I wanted to remain part of the underage setup because I enjoyed it. But the, you know, it was a case of I can't keep doing this forever. There needs to be an actual role and that didn't really come to fruition. So as in when you say an actual role, in an ideal world you might have liked the FAI to say, well you didn't have a role then. What was your, your role? Was it was a year that I was willing to say right. Like here's a volunteer where I am. kind of thing, yeah. almost. So okay, done. Which was helping me as well because sure. I was obviously on a course of doing doing licenses, doing different courses, managerial courses, and to be involved with the teams to see how international setup worked as a coach, yeah. as a manager, at the analyst side of it, all the rest of the time constraints that you have at international level compared to club level. So all that was really good for me. Um, but obviously you can't keep that going, it's just ridiculous and the amount of time I was away from home. So I, I wanted to stay involved with it, but didn't no really. no offer of anything? Yeah, eventually, but it came too late, right. which was a shame because I'd already moved on to, to doing other bits and bobs yeah, and yeah. committed See, my just time. Look, that kind of stuff, you know, that's where you kind of wonder how the organisation is run at times. Like, that doesn't sound like your experience was great or like you were really made feel. You're a former player, mm. you've played at the top level, let's get you involved. And, give you something which you can jump at and make it easy for you to say yes, mm. is my point. Well, I think that, and it, this is the point I'm trying to make, if, and I'm not necessarily talking this about me, sure. if there's a player, ex-player that you've identified that is a good coach, yeah. we should be learning from the mistakes that we made, Lee Carsley being a prime example. And I don't know the circumstance of exactly what happened a few years ago, but if we could have got him as part of his education as a coach at club level, whatever he was doing, then it would have obviously been beneficial for our, our underage players and then that link that we're talking about between the senior team, the 21s and down. Mm. There needs to be a pivotal role there for someone like Lee Carsley, Stephen Reid, Damien Duff, whoever it is that is focused on coaching and has a desire and is willing to put in the hard work which all those three have done, mm -hmm. then it's a no-brainer, isn't it? You would think so. <laughs> the um, draw for the under-21 qualifying campaign is in December 12th, I think. Mm. So, I, in, in an ideal world, they might like to have someone in place then. So, we might see you over the next few weeks. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Okay, we want to touch on Premier League relegation scrap. Mm -hmm. I know you're cracking into this, Joe. It's the, uh, it's the second season, so a few of those, I'm sure, will be making changes in the not-too-distant future. Um, Huddersfield Fulham was on Monday night. I don't know whether you've seen much of that. You were probably in here seeing bits and bobs of it, were you? In here. Yeah, so nailed on for me, home win. Covered Fulham twice in the last few weeks. And uh, to give a background on Fulham, they've spent about 100 million quid yeah. in the summer. Got promoted in a really stylish manner, playing magnificent football. A couple of players in particular, Sean Young Ryan Sesson Young, he's only 18 years of age. Kearney, the captain. Brought in all these players. Chucked a load of them in at the same time at the start of the season. Just hasn't worked. Mm. 
trying to find that balance, constantly changing a back four. It's kept it fairly uh, familiar in the last few weeks. But again, like the, the, the centre half issue in particular, Dennis Adoy, Tim Ream, I wasn't convinced by them last year in the Championship, and here they are playing in the Premier League. So they just haven't found that balance, and they still want to play in a, in a very stylish, mm. open manner. I don't know if you've ever been to Huddersfield, have you? Not a nice place to go and play football, especially with the fans, with the way they are. They've kept on board with the whole euphoria of getting promoted. The novelty of being in the Premier League is yeah. still there. The fans are amazing. It rocks. It's windy. All four corners of the ground is open. It's always windy. It's a little bit like Stoke. Yeah. So this was a banker home win for me because I look at the two sets of players, the way they play, Fulham wanting to play in a certain way, Huddersfield aren't, they were a little bit more direct on Monday, but they've, they can roll their sleeves up, they can scrap, they can fight, they proved it last year, and they have got quality in certain areas. Centre forward is an issue, Mounier and the Poitier just look like they can't score goals, um, but I thought all day long it was a home win, banker. Mm. Having said that, I still think both of them are in trouble. Okay. But I think if Fulham make a managerial change, which is conceivable, let's be honest, because of the predicament they find themselves in, with the type of players that they have, if they can get things right defensively, they certainly have the players in an attacking fashion to cause problems, and if they get the balance right. Um, but I think that the two of them are in, in for a tricky Probably. season, okay. yeah, big time. Um, the other one, which is, for me, at the start of the season, the, just seeing the table here, so Fulham are bottom, five points, Cardiff on five points, Huddersfield on six. I said at the start of the season, that Huddersfield and Cardiff for me are absolutely nailed on for relegation. Mainly because of, I just thought, the start of last season, Huddersfield did so well, got themselves a little advantage by the, the points total that they, they got going in the first four, five, six games of the season. Yeah. They have managed to do that this year. Um, I think it will be a struggle. So I think it's going to be them two plus A and other. When you look at Cardiff, I don't know how they got promoted. I really don't. With the players they had, the squad they have, it was always going to be very difficult. Neil Warnock's on the screen there. He's a big reason, obviously, why they, they got promoted. The spirit that they played with, they were so direct, so horrible and scrappy to play against. Mm. Nobody relished playing against them. So he was a huge factor in that. Having really invested a lot, brought in Josh Murphy, Bobby Reid, Greg Harry Cunningham, Arthur. Harry Arthur on loan, yeah. So they brought in solid citizens. Goals, again, being an issue. And again, defensively, very much what they had Last year, mm. play very deep, um, rely on long throws, set pieces. It's not going to be enough. Not going to be enough. Okay. Um, so for me, they're they're down, but no disgrace in that whatsoever. I think you use that money to make sure that the club is in a sound place. Reinvest. Well, the Sean Dyche Bournemouth example is the one. Isn't exactly. It? It's a great way yeah. to get relegated. Yeah. If you can West Brom did it, going back 10, yeah. 12 years ago. Maybe the boing boing baggies up down yo yo club. Every time they got went back down, buying the club was in a sounder place to bounce back. And I think that's the template that Cardiff City need to use. Because a few years ago, they went up under Malachi McCoy, mm. dropped back down, and it was whew, financially here. We, oh, yeah. wow, we're all over the place here. So they've, they've done it in a sound way, even with investment boys, but they also need to be realistic. Like, is sacking Neil Warnock with that squad of players, if someone else comes in, I don't think they're going to do too much more, to be perfectly honest. Mm. Whereas you look at some of the other squads, Fulham, Possibly someone might get a little more of a tune out of them. Uh, Southampton under Mark Hughes. Mm. I look at that squad, and we, how many times have we heard this on paper? Good squad. Mm. I'm not seeing it, Joe, at all. Okay. I think they're strolling. I think some of the players are are believing that the hype and their reputations, and they're not actually producing a level that you need intensity wise to get results at Premier League level. So that's even coming from Mark Hughes. Yeah. Or it's coming for the players themselves. What's the word on Mark Hughes as a manager? Not sure, Joe, to be honest. Yeah, I, I, I would question it. Not, never mind the word. What I would suggest about in the last two, three years, which I've been doing this job, and I go over and commentate on Premier League games every Saturday, I would have seen his Stoke side quite a, quite a bit. Mm. I have to say, when I, when I got my schedule on my road and I, and I had to go and see Stoke, it, I, I never enjoyed it. They were probably my least favourite team over the last couple of years when he was mm. in charge mm. because I didn't know what they were. You knew what they were under Tony Pulis. You might not like the style of play, but you knew what they were doing. He tried to change that. Some of the recruitment was shocking. It really was. Um, and I didn't know what they were. Mm. Now, he kept Southampton up at the end of last season. But again, I go back to the squad. I think there were was, there was decent ingredients for him to work with there. But I th I, 
they should not be in a relegation mm. fight. They really shouldn't. They mm. should be comfortably mid-table, looking to be that Burnley, like Watford, like Bournemouth out this year, the Burnley of last year, who can get 6th, 7th, 8th position, whatever that's going to be in the league. Southampton should be in that bracket, but they're not. Mm. Um, there's a couple of others. I think Palace are going to be fine. I think Burnley are going to be fine. They're just getting over the Europa League tough yeah. very transfer window that they had and the whole euphoria of last year under Sean Dyche. It's very, very hard to emulate what they did last year and maybe a little bit of that, but I think he'll he'll get it back on. I think we've already seen signs of that. He'll stay calm as well, that's yeah. important. West Ham, poor start, got it going. Mm. Declan Rice isn't doing too well, isn't he? I just thought Jamie Redknapp last week was the latest. Oh, jumping on the bandwagon. He All was right. saying that uh, nice. he watched Rice in that first game against Liverpool. Remember, he got taken off at half time. I wasn't having that, by the way, that first. He got he got thrown under the bus. A little bit. It's easy to pull off the 19 year old kid um, when yeah. it's not going well. But <clears throat> yeah. Redknapp was saying last few weeks, he's totally won me over. And Gareth Southgate should be knocking on this young oh, man's do door. Do me a favour, <laughs> Jamie. Do me a favour. <laughs> <laughs> right, moving on. We've got Stephen Reid joining us on the line. Stephen, thanks for joining us, pal. No problems. Keith, I just bumped into Alan Judge, actually. I was just wandering along. So I just, uh, I've just, I've just been talking about knees, knees and rehab for the last 15 minutes. Did you really judges, bump into so Alan Judge? It's yeah. good to see him. Hello, sorry? You just bumped into Alan Judge, seriously? Alan Judge, seriously. I'm, I've just popped into town and Alan Judge, I just see him there with his, with his missus and the kids. No and way. As we always do when I bump into him, we we usually end up talking about... About the game ready and you know, Dave Fever, the physio. Game ready, all the injuries. Yeah. I told him not to wander too far in case his, his knee starts swelling up. It was, it was, it was good to see him. Good to, have, good to have a chat. He's a good lad. He's a, he's a good player. He would have been, Alan Judge would have been at Blackburn um, when we were we were He would together. have. He was, um, he would he was have. a great we, young player. We spoke a little bit about that and we, we spoke about... Because our injuries came at a similar time because yeah. he was absolutely flying when he... Obviously, that is ACL reconstruction, and and he's still, I think he's still trying to trying to find his feet and, and get back to his best where he was. I remember seeing him and, and being in a in a Reading squad and involved at Reading when when he was flying. So mm. hopefully, hopefully he gets back on track. Yeah, I totally agree. When you say pop into town, where is popping into town these days? Well, ta- Kingston, Kingston. It's just pretty local now. I I ended up moving sort of back down. South. I was in Manchester, as, as Keith knows, for for 15 years through my time at, at Blackburn and, and West Brom. But a couple of years ago, we we decided to to move back down south, back to London, back to the smoke, pal. Back to the smoke. Back to the smoke. Back to the smoke, mate. Listen, you left Crystal Palace at the end of the season. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing since. Has it been family time? Just taking that little bit of time out to to chill out a bit because yeah, you went straight into yeah, coaching for playing, bit, didn't you? A little bit of family time. I've, I've sort of taken my taken myself away from from football a little bit. I've had I've been to a couple of couple of pro license events. Uh, I, I graduated in the summer and, and got my pro license, but just started to, to get to a few games now. I'm going to West Brom at the weekend, and then going to do the Manchester derby for you guys on, on Sunday, and then St George's Park again for a couple of days next week. So a few little bits and pieces, and, and catching up with people that I've. I've not seen for a while because, as you, as you know, Keith, you've been in it coaching and playing. Sometimes you, as an old saying, it ships in the night and you yeah. don't catch up with people. But I've actually been doing a bit of that. I went up to Burnley to to see Daishi and, and watch them train for a couple of days. So it's been it's been it's been good actually. It's been been good to get a little breather because uh, because the last last few years has been pretty full on. Yeah, Joe, we, we we were speaking earlier on. I told you when Stephen was coming on, and the first thing you said, what, what you want to talk about was. The, the role of as assistant manager stroke coach, wasn't it? And the time wise. Well, I'm very curious. So, I mean, it strikes me looking in from afar. I mean, you can you can put me wrong here, but um, the amount of time that the assistant has to put in, the money, all the all the glory. You know, being the manager is clearly you know you're kind of top dog, and then there's such a big fall off in the number two. And I I don't think we fully get it. it was something Kev mentioned to me a while back. Just how demanding the number two job is for you know a lot less of the glory, a lot less of the money, all the trappings. Yeah, you've kind of been on that train. Yeah, yeah, and it and it is full on. It's I literally went from from playing into into two weeks later after retiring from playing, I was straight in at straight in at the deep end at Reading with Steve Clark, and didn't really get any chance there to to reflect on my career. Obviously, Keith knows that 
sort of turmoil at times. I went through with the with the knee injuries, and the last five six years of playing was was really tough. And then to go straight into the coaching the coaching scene, which was obviously a great opportunity for for a couple of years at Reading, it it was tough. But but you're right, you, you're so full on, and and the, one of the most difficult things about it is the fact that you've got to come in every day motivated, enthusiastic, even when you're feeling feeling terrible. You know, you might have lost a game the day before. Obviously, last season at Palace, we lost the first seven and had no points and no goals. So you, you still got to come in positive. You still got to come in and try and lift the players and at times lift the manager as well. And you sort of get caught in the middle of a little bit where actually who's there to, to give you a lift when you need it maybe because you, you there isn't anyone really. It's just your job to or I saw it as my job to, to try and lift the players, lift the group, but also when the manager was having those low moments, try and, try and manage him and, and lift him as well. So it's, it's, it's non-stop. It's, it really is full on. And you can be the guy who's told, well, can you come in first thing in the morning and then also can you maybe go and have a look at that team we're playing in two weeks' time, you know, eight, nine o'clock at night. Like the hours I hadn't fully appreciated are absolutely ferocious at times. Well, it, well, it, it, it is full on. It's... I know people say it, I'm sure people know it's not your your normal sort of eight till six or nine till five job and you can you can put your computer away and, and chill out and relax with the family because it is it is full on the whole time. You might be in training all day and then you've got to go to a game and scout a game in the evening. Mm. And even when even when I had a day off, it's it's not really a day off because I'd be watching clips. Uh the last couple of years I had the had the job of sort of set plays as well, so I'd be watching watching corners, free kicks for and against the strengths and weaknesses, and starting to put, especially at Reading, second year at Reading was putting the video together ourselves. Change a little bit at Palace where the analysts would have more of a influence on that. But on your days off, you're thinking about the next day. You're thinking about the training session. Mm. Who's training? You might have to speak with a with a doctor. You might have to go through a a meeting that you're going to take the next morning and trying to prep yourself for that. So it is, it is full on, it's non-stop. And, and I just found that you've not really got any days where you can really, really relax because even if you do win a game, it's on to the next one within, within that initial relief and joy of the three points within, within a short space of time. It's right. Let's start watching clips and get ready for, for the next game, whether that's on the Tuesday or whether that's, the next weekend. That that's that's where coaching, that's where modern day management is now. That's the level. And I, I read a piece in the paper last week, and it was the the Guardian. Maybe spent the week with Javi Grazia at Watford. I don't know where you read it. And his schedule was exactly what Stephen's saying. So Stephen, first team coach at, at Crystal Palace, he's the go between a lot of the times yeah. between the analyst who we both know, a lad called Rob. He will be looking at those clips, the sports yeah, science department. It's it's, it's it's that. That is the role. It is twenty four seven, everyone's coming nonstop, yeah. and it takes it. It, it, it is. takes and, its toll. And, and alongside that, Keith, as well, you, you sort of got to filter out a lot of the noise. You've got mm. to sort of decide: Do I need to tell the manager that? Yeah. And you, you've got to, all the time medical issues, sports science issues. As a manager, I don't want to speak to the manager about that. He's got enough on his plate, and you've sort of got to filter out the information that you that you do give him. Some managers want want to know everything. Some managers don't want to know know anything unless unless it's a, a crisis, unless, mm. it, unless it's an emergency. So there's all there's all sorts going on. That's yeah, very, and it that's is, very interesting. It is relentless. Realize, didn't realise that some managers would be kind of like, you know, we were we were sort of half liking it outside to I don't know a law firm where you've got the partner and then the assistant manager is the poor lad and his first yeah. year in there doing all the grunt work down the bottom and only if it's really a big issue does it go upstairs you know most of like whether it's players that Stephen's talking about or the, the different uh, different departments within the football club medical yeah. sports science analysis it's like it's grown so much and these different departments in the last year and everybody goes to the number two or the first team coach because again if we go back to when we were players we'll have a moan up to the the coach because we know that'll get filtered back whereas you wouldn't maybe be as brave yeah. as saying that to the, the manager door. okay <laughs> yeah. absolutely and so is it, it, it is it like a touch of burnout with it Stephen or do you want to get back in or did it kind of put you off doing the role no it doesn't doesn't put me off it I think the experiences that I had were were incredible and I still don't think that you can ever beat that feeling of winning a game whether that's as a 
as a player or whether you're on the coaching staff, you you know, you just can't replace that feeling of, of winning a game, knowing what you've done during the week, especially on the coaching side. When you've worked all week, you might have had your individual meetings with a couple of players and, and see them deliver on a Saturday and go on and win the game. So I think, no, I don't think it will be a case of walking away for good. I think it was just a case of just felt it was a time to enjoy the family a little bit more. I think this goes back to my last six, seven years of playing where when I look back at it now, for the whole of the kids' lives, I was icing my knee. Mm. I was mm. flying all around the world for career-ending surgery, you know, potentially career-saving surgeries. And I probably at times wasn't in a in a great place and never really had time to, to reflect on that, to look back at it, to actually enjoy some quality time with the family because <laughs> laughing about it now, but sort of seeing Judgy there on his day off. Yeah. And I used to remember those when... I had to think about, could I go out with the missus and the kids and push the pram around because my knee was starting to swell up. Just just mm. little things like that that mm. you take for granted, but that might mean you're playing on a on a Saturday or a Tuesday night or, or missing the game because the, knee, the knee's too swollen. So I think it's just a case of just taking a step back, having a bit of a breather, but still doing the, the bits of involvement with the, with the coaching badges that I've started to help out a little little bit with and and going to games as well. So I'm looking forward to the weekend, the West Brom one on Saturday and, and the, the Manchester Derby on Sunday. We were just chatting before you came on. I don't really caught the end of it, maybe about the Ireland 21's job, Lee Carr, has he been linked with it today? And I was making the point that just because you're an ex-Irish international doesn't mean you should be associated with this, with this type of job. And I've been involved with, mm. with the underage teams, but the point I was making was, He's certainly gone around things the right way. He's involved with the FA, and I know you do bits and bobs with the FA, and you've you've obviously got your pro license over there. It's yeah, it's players, ex players, and coaches like him, like you, and I threw Duffer into the equation because he's taking it very seriously as well. Would that be yeah. something that might tempt you? I think it could possibly. It definitely, it, it definitely could. I, I know, obviously, having spoken to you over time, Keith, and especially when we spoke about it or when we briefly spoke about it earlier on today about that role, and I, I think it's an important role. You know, you, you're looking at a 21s group that are still in most of them in their development mm. stage of their career. So I don't think it can go to someone that has no experience of that, that type of role or working in the game. It, it, it's a, for me, it'd be a difficult one to be a, a first job in football, to, to head that up, because it's... You know, you've got to inspire this group. This hopefully will be the group that will then start dipping their toe into the senior setup. Like you see with Gareth Southgate now, mm -hmm. you've almost got players bypassing playing Premier League football almost and going straight from the 21s into the senior group. Yeah. So I don't see why that can't be a similar situation where you've got a group that are improving and developing in the 21s that then join the, then join the senior group. Because I still remember when I played 21s football. It, I used to, I used to absolutely buzz for meeting up, and when we used to have a 21s game against the senior team, the senior 11, and it was it was brilliant. And anyone that did well in that group, and that 21s game against the seniors, Mick would Mick would throw in. He would call them over for a couple of training sessions. But that's why it's so important that that 21s group are looked after, that are developed with good quality coaching that can. Hope, help, hopefully help him along the way. Yeah, I've constantly said about, and we were only chatting about it before, weren't we, about that link between, whereas at the moment I feel like the link isn't there between our senior team, our 21s. It seems that there's a big bridge between that and gone are the days where, Stephen just mentioned, we're trained in the same place or arranged those early parts of the week of playing those little mm. games against each other. And, and players like Stephen, obviously, Sean, where he got the opportunity, Mick, Mick throws him in because of certain things that he sees. So it's a massive, yeah. it's a massive appointment for us. And Stephen, do you mind me asking? Because I mean, it's relatively fresh news that Noel King is stepping aside and moving elsewhere within the FAI. How does the yeah. process tend to work now? I mean, are you expected to apply and send in some kind of CV? Is there someone that you potentially phone, or do you just wait by the phone yourself and you hope maybe if it rings, you have a chat? Like, is there any set way this thing works? I th um. 
I think his age is sat here, isn't he? <laughs> Me. Yeah. I mean, Ke Keith well, Andrews yeah. is obviously getting ten percent, <laughs> but just in terms. Yeah. Of <laughs> but yeah, Keith makes a good point. I, th I think if you're actively if you're actively looking to to get back in, you'd probably have an agent that would make a call, or you might know someone that's got a role at a club or is involved in the selection process that you might contact and and let them know about your availability. Uh, the FAI might have someone in mind already, or and it works the same at, at club level. Yeah. They might already have someone in mind already that they're earmarked. They still might advertise the role, but they might know that they know who they want in that role. But agents are playing a bigger and bigger part in in not just we're not talking about the the top end of, of Premier League managers and coaches. You're talking all the way through the the system mm -hmm. from. Premier League level all the way down to to grassroots level that you you're going to be getting coaches that are, know someone or've got an agent or know someone that can can make the phone call make the email and and let your interest known so also probably a little bit of a little bit of word of mouth it might be an article that a couple of names have mentioned like Lee Lee Carsley's been mentioned a few times about that role and maybe someone in the FAI might see that and might not even know what he's up to. Mm. As, silly, as stupid as it sounds, something like that, because even when I was working at Crystal Palace or Reading, I'd bump into people and say that I was at Reading or Palace, and it would be, oh, what role you, have you got there? What age group are you taking? Yeah. So yeah, people yeah, actually yeah. don't know sometimes mm. until they actually see you on the telly or, or read about it in the newspaper. Mm. Not to turn this into a de facto job interview, but um, you've worked under some really good managers. You know, I think... Roy Hodgson, everybody understands, yeah, knows Stam. how to set up a team, and you have Stam and various people. Yeah. Uh, who do you feel has shaped you? I guess it applies to your playing career as well, as well as, as your, as your um, coaching career. You know, when you're thinking about the manager you're going to be and how you might set up a team, whose voice is in your head or, or what kind of lessons have you taken think, from people in particular? I think there's a, there, there genuinely, genuinely is, a, a, is a mixture. I think the way that Roy conducts himself on and away away from the training ground is first class. He, I think he was a, speaking to people within the club, the players, staff. I think when he came in, obviously I came in alongside with, with Ray Lewinton as well. I think it brought a, a breath of fresh air. I think the respect that he's got for everyone at the club. He's, he goes in the physio room every day to check on the injuries. He speaks seven languages. So hmm. he had the respect of a lot of the players from the start. You know the French. The French boys used to, you know, used to love him. You know, if he used to speak to them in French, he was, you know, they fell in love with him from yeah. the start. Just, just little bits like that. Yeah. Uh, Steve what? Clark's coaching and organ organizational skills were were first class. So there, there is. Gen I know people say it, and you, you sort of think as you go along, you take bits and pieces from each from each manager. But that genuinely is the case. What are his seven languages? Uh, was he speaks Swedish? He speaks French. He speaks um, a little bit of Spanish. He speaks Italian, maybe. I think he, it, it, Italian, sort of fluent in Italian. Um, well, there's how many's that? <laughs> <laughs> He's a cool customer, though, isn't he? Really, the way he, I, I, I totally get the saying about the way he works, the way I would have got that as a player with him was together. But then you've seen a different side to that. Going on to yeah. the, the staff side, was he impressive in that that aspect as well? Yeah, but I just sort of ca just sort of carried it on, kids. The way that I sort of went about my business as a player, that just sort of carried on when I worked alongside him. Mm. From a, from being a player, I knew when he had the arm poor yeah. in a mood and <laughs> and how to how to deal with him, how to work alongside him as a player, and that's exactly what I did as a as a coach. But seeing him firsthand. You know, from first the difference with someone like Roy Hodgson, and it's I think it's quite unusual, but I do think it's come from his experience as a manager tr throughout Europe, and obviously he just loves it. He loves being on the grass. It is, doesn't and, he? and 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 the, and the lads respect that, Keith. You know, on a on a Sunday where you got maybe six or seven players that have not kicked a ball on a Saturday in the game, and the manager comes out on the Sunday to to take a session. Yeah, that's that's quite rare, and I think the lads respect that and. That also helps you as well as a first-team coach because when the manager's out there, 
don't care what anyone says, that gives the players an extra 5 or 10% yeah, course, when they're yeah. training. Yeah. As, as soon as the manager's not out there, rightly or wrongly, it's not quite got the, the same intensity. And I think he knows that. I think from the experience, he knows that. And he's, he's out there every day. Mm. doesn't I, have to. There are some days, don't get me wrong, when I was thinking, you know, I'll take this little bit. You don't yeah, really yeah. need to be getting him. <laughs> but he can't help it. He can't help but it's get involved. And, and I think that just that brings a respect around the club. I presume, Stephen, uh, you want to take a top job, be, be a manager somewhere, as opposed to staying as a, having a career as a number two? Yeah, I, I, I think after, after the last three years, and you know, you get a feel of, of what you like, what you maybe don't like as much, and then you, sometimes you get a little bit frustrated as well, and you sort of think, you know, I want to, be in, I want to actually maybe even plan a session a day or two before or whatever you, however you might want to work. And you, I think that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate aim is to then all what you've learned along the way or the bits that you like and you don't like, you can sort of mold that into your own way of working with, with great people that you've worked with along the way, because that's what you sort of identify straight away. And Keith mentioned a little bit earlier in the call about one of the, the analysts at Crystal Palace who's, was well, spot on. You work with good people, and you think, "I'd, I'd like to work with someone like that." Mm. Later on down the line, and you, you sort of identify how you might do it and and how you might want to work. Yeah. And key question: Would you be a tracksuit manager on the touchline, or are you going to go for a suit? Three piece. You better stick to three piece. suits. I'm telling you. Three piece. Sure. Keith will have to point me in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get a few. New, I've been in a tracksuit for. Uh, for three years, so um, <laughs> yeah, Keith might have to put. He's looking sharp these days he when sure I see him on the yeah. box. So I'll have to give him a shout. How are your knees, by the way? Can you go for a run of a Wednesday Shocking. afternoon? Shocking. Do you know? Do you know? I everything after I after I finished playing, I everything settled down nicely and couldn't even look at a gym, let alone go in one. <laughs> so everything everything was pretty good. And then back end of last season, I played a ball into a session and and felt a felt a strange click in, in the knee and I sort of knew, you know, I can almost be a, a knee specialist. So I, I kind of knew what it was and settled down again. But I was away with the kids last week and I was on a big inflatable thing in the sea. I was away and away for a few days and the knees just, it's just ballooned again. Wow. So I might have to have it, I might have to have it looked at again. Um, but apart from that, yeah, the <laughs> bit of running was fine. Yeah. I was, I was going to be um, playing in the soccer sixes in in January in Glasgow, um, so I think that's that's knocked on the head, which is a bit disappointing. But all in all, it's it's not too bad. And to be honest, I don't have to train or play anymore. So you know, it is what it is. At least I've not got that pressure now of of trying to get the swelling down and the knee dictating the life, which is which is a good place to be. Yeah. Before you go, you mentioned you're on um, commentary duty on, on Sunday. Well, I think you're with Nathan, aren't you, yeah. for um, the Manchester yeah. Derby? I might be Dave, actually. I think are Dave, you with Dave? Are you? Apologies. Yeah, I think I'm with Dave, yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Um, He's got number so one, much. that's important. He has got number one, to be fair, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Before you go, talking to Derby, not particularly that one, but Derby's you played in. Well, what was the biggest one? Was it was it Millwall, West Ham? Did you get to play in that one, or was it? I didn't play it to be it. Different honestly, leagues, were they? I, I think that I think the Blackburn Burnley one had, yeah, had quite a lot about. It. Well, it was that one or West Brom? West Brom Wolves was was massive as well. Obviously, that. So you played for Blackburn played Burnley and Burnley Blackburn, one. didn't you? Was that one, Keith? You sorry? played Blackburn Burnley. Who was who was, who was, was, a, who was managing was then? One. It, that would have been. Hmm, I think that would have been Sparky. Was it? Yeah. I think it was a cup game. It was the one one of the Burnley fans run off and run on and and got right in Savage's face and thought it was all going to kick off. Yeah. That was a that was a tasty one. That it, was a really tasty one and 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 the West Brom Wolves one as well. Maybe not not as much, but mm. that was that was a was a real big derby and they're, and they're the ones that I really did enjoy playing in. Enjoyed it when used to get a bit of stick off the opposition fans. Yeah. The, there, this is some of the games that you you remember when you finish, especially that derby win where we where we won five one at Wolves. That was probably one of the highlights of my time at uh, uh, West Brom. West Brom, yeah. 
listen, good luck on Sunday. I hope it goes well with the uh, the A commentator, Dave. And, um, <laughs> and I'll, I'll be talking to you from studio. You're surrounded yeah, by John, greatness. Yeah. You know, stop. Uh, it's it's in incredible. The warm office. And we'll, we'll nice keep you posted studio. about that 21s job, right? <laughs> 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 Thanks for Go joining man, us. Boys. See you, pal. All right. What a great gent. fella. Yeah, he's he's, he's a, a diamond. Yeah. diamond. I've said it before when he's been on. I love being with him at both Blackburn and then we were together at West Brom. Um, just decent, decent fella. And the, the injury troubles, ah, you, terrible. Were, you were like kind of going, wow. You see it every day. Like when he was obviously injured, you would see the, the work that he would have to go through to get fit. Mm. Um, but then even when he was fit, managing the knee and mm. managing the sessions, the load. The game ready after lived on ice machine called the game ready. If people aren't familiar with it, it's it's a, an ice machine, but it compresses as well. It was you know it was just part and parcel of them. So we'd all shame. turn up with wash bags. He right. would turn up with it, really with a game ready. It's such a shame. That's where he was, he like, burst on the scene in 02 and whacked that free kick yeah. off the bar. And he's so big and physical yeah. and good technically. It's a quality player. And even the way he segued into right back was a testament to how good a player he was. Exactly. Like that Game was and by necessity. He was really and not, good. Not the quickest, not the, not, you know, in terms of being playing in that position where wingers were getting quicker and quicker and full-backs were having to change the way they played. So you're right, to even evolve into that type of right-back where he played very, really, really well at West Brom in particular when he went yeah. there. Great fella. You mentioned uh, derbies. Here is Keith Andrews' big derby moment. And pulls it back. And Andrews shoots and finds the net. The final touch of humiliation to Wolves fans. A man who started his career at Molyneux has finished them off this afternoon. Well, he's obviously enjoyed that, hasn't he, Keith Andrews? You often see players coming back to former grounds and not celebrating, but none of that for Keith Andrews. You, Judas. Well, Keith Andrews. That was the day Nick McCarthy, that was his last game Nick's for Wolves last as game, well. yeah. So you... Nick hasn't mentioned that to me, yeah. Yeah, thanks for nothing, Keith. Wow. Flat track bully, it what was 5 nil. did you need to? It wasn't, it was 4, <laughs> <laughs> I got the 5th, <laughs> left foot, bang. Yeah. So what, did, you, did you think about not celebrating as a matter no. of interest? No, you're not no interested. chance, okay. no <laughs> chance. They held me for the guts of 2-3 to three years, Wolves, when I was under contract, so I was itching to get out of that place okay. and forge a career for myself where I stuttered and stalled for the last few years. Went there as 15 and for the first 6 years loved my time there, but the last few, just needed to get out a few long moves and just became stale. I fell out of love of football. Really? In that Wolves, yeah. So when I went back there years and years later, having made a good career for myself and was relishing the opportunity at West Brom under Roy Hodgson, that was, went there in the January with the Euros in the 2012, summer. 2012, yeah. I was, yeah. I was playing well, playing really well, playing some of the best career, playing some of the best football in my career. Mm. That was just buying, let's have it. And, not celebrate, not a chance, <laughs> not a chance. You look incredibly, I mean that photo, lean and strong, you look healthy, like you look really in great shape, yeah. like you were playing the best football. Oh, I was flying, yeah, yeah, I was enjoying it, I was enjoying it, and it, Reedy's even said it, like Reedy had played God knows how many games before for West Brom, he'd been part of the promotion season, mm. and he even picks it out as one of the, one of the, because it is the biggest derby in the Midlands for them too, Villa Birmingham is the big one for them, Yeah. and Wolves against West Brom, there is genuine hatred between those two clubs. So I've played obviously in ones for Wolves against West Brom. Had a really good win against a good West Brom so I've gone back to when Gary Megson was the manager. I think Dave Jones was our manager back in like 2001, two, maybe something around that time. Uh, but then full circle 2012. <laughs> yeah, good crack. Good crack getting to my car after that game by the way. I would think oh. so, yeah. Yeah, not like... Well, we're just being abused. Just abuse, yeah. Just abuse, getting ready to have it and didn't obviously get to that level but <laughs> good fun good fun I enjoyed my time at West Brom it was Roy Hodgson going to be the England manager in the summer killed that he left Steve Clark came in contract offer wasn't there anymore so I had to go on and kick on elsewhere which was a real shame mm. a few more years under Hodgson would have been just the ticket <sighs> loved working under him yeah loved working under him I mean with Reid to get to see it I mean Hodgson if he's known for nothing else is how to set up a team yeah um, so you've learnt at I mean, I guess one of the masters in that, you know. I can see where he's coming from in terms of the wanting to do a session his way, wanting to do this, wanting to do that. I think his next step will be as a manager somewhere. And I sort of alluded to in the questioning, but um, in fairness, he's not going to talk about that, understandably. But like managers in Premier League now are pulling in a couple of million minimum mm. a year. Like it's a big old drop to the poor old assistants. Oh, 
Joe, honestly. People, don't, people wouldn't believe how big a drop it is. Wouldn't have a clue. Maybe not so much Premier League level. I think they get looked after, assistant managers in particular. Not, not, then another drop to first team coaches, then big drops to analysts, etc. unless you're at the top, top clubs. Yeah. But then you drop out of the Premier League into the Championship and League Ones. Whew. It's, yeah. Massive drop. Yeah. People Massive. Think there's, and there's, the hours that Stevens are losing, he's nailed yeah. on the head. Like, you're up non-stop. It's, yeah. You're in early. You're pre- you're pre- if you're doing it right, yes. and if you're going to have, in this day and age, if you're going to have a period of success, you need to be doing it right or yeah. you'll get found out. Because people just assume the whole, everyone's awash with money. Like everyone's yeah. on inflated wages, not but not actually it's not it. the case. Yeah, yeah, was it ever a weird thing, um, not to, I know, can't talk here all day. Was it ever a weird thing as a footballer to be on colossal money mm. compared to the man on the street and walking by, I don't know, the receptionist and then the people in the canteen and the person washing jerseys? Was it ever, did you ever think this is a bit weird? Yeah, it's... Is it there? It's a good point because I think maybe the early part of your career you're not you're just in the clouds sure, or whatever you don't realise yeah. or whatever but then I do think as you get that sense of where it is and um, I think I think certain clubs not just ones I've been at but you know the traditional one town clubs or whatever they would take advantage of people in that town wanted to work for that football club because it was a slight kind of I work for this club I work for that but they would take advantage of that when it came to actually paying wages yeah. we had a big thing at MK Dons a few years ago where the holy grail was getting to the championship so 10-12 years ago we got from league 1 sorry from league 2 as champions up to league 1 I left then to go to Blackburn but they stayed at that level I went back then and I was, I was the first team coach with Carl Robinson we got them up but some of the staff had remained throughout that whole period of 10 years and the holy grail was get to the championship you'll get rewarded mm. get to it that was the carry that was the carry Got to the championship, did they get rewarded? Did they? Yeah. And it didn't sit well with me, really didn't sit well with me. Mm. Not for me, but mm. for those other staff members who'd been on the whole journey, ups, downs, promises, false promises. Mm. And I think that's kind of, that's the way it is in football, unfortunately. Because it's been an interesting thing recently where Premier League clubs in particular have been highlighted for not paying a living wage. Yeah. You know. And you look at the excesses at one end in comparison yeah. with people not being made the living yeah. wage. And I'll tell you what does happen a lot. And with kit men, with uh, yeah. the boot men, the, the cleaning lady, the canteen lady, whoever it is, I think players now are ridiculously generous are they? when it comes to Christmas. And not just the big clubs, you know, have whip arounds at Christmas for local hospices, charities, things like that. And then people in and around the, the training ground too, if they get a few hundred quid, will make a big difference to their Christmas or whatever. And then I know for a fact the Man City boot boys and kit men are on a nice little number <laughs> from all the players yeah, yeah, yeah. so obviously that's at a different sure level yeah, yeah. have I got time to do Sheffield Joe or quickly quickly we've run over Sheffield we... Derby we've <laughs> run over Sheffield Derby tomorrow Steel City Derby yeah it's. I think it's a proper derby uh, got into a little bit with Stephen about the big derbies I think some of them are a little bit kind of made more than what they are I think this is a genuine one dates back to 1890 Sheffield United flying in third position just the point off the top behind Leeds Norwich sandwich in between Real and Sheffield Wednesday 17th on 19 points um, they've lost four in a row there's a real contrast in the way these two teams have gone about things Sheffield Wednesday in the last few years have spent some serious cash mm. really speculated to try and get over that line and get promotion didn't happen now it's, oh dear, okay. cutbacks, players going out on loan to get wages in, only one player being signed on a permanent basis in the last two transfer windows. It's a difficult time. The manager's come in, he's a German manager, Jost Lukai, sorry, Dutch manager, but he's more of a, a German type in terms of the way he goes about things, but they're all over the place at the moment. Okay. Defensively, 12 goals in the last four games. No. Sheffield United, Chris Wilder, stood on the terraces in the 80s as a fan, watch him on the sideline, watch his team play. He basically says he wants his team to play in the way his fans, the fans want to watch football being played. Front foot, in your face. They play three at the back with wing backs. The right side and the left side of the centre half of the three at the back overlap at times. Oh, uh, Joe, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. <laughs> Is this on TV on Brilliant. Friday? It's on tomorrow night. I'll the have a look. Sheffield United are one of the best teams to watch. Okay. Obviously, always doesn't come off. Very rarely a negative type game or a dull game when they are involved. Okay. So really looking forward to that. 
Um, I have to say, I fancy a, a Sheffield win. On Derby, so the Manchester Derby, Sheffield Derby, yeah. we were, you know, I was flicking through, there's all the obvious ones. Without question, the strangest Derby I came across, this blew up last year, is Crystal Palace against Brighton. Mm. There's no historical links, industrial links. It's a strange one. This, this, just, this did not exist as a Derby until the 70s. Okay. Okay, so that was when Alan Mullery took over at Brighton and Terry Venables came in at Palace. And so things kicked off in the late 70s when they played each other a bunch of times, FA Cups, various things. At one stage, Alan Mullery was walking out of the tunnel and someone threw boiling hot coffee all over him. Yeah. So Mullery took out all the money in his pocket and threw it on the ground and said, that's all you're all worth. <laughs> okay? So that kind of kicked things off. And it kind of ticked along various places. Where it really blew up was in 2013. So Amex Stadium, I'll read from The Guardian. Go. Uh, Brighton have launched an investigation after excrement. <laughs> that's right, Keith. Excrement was found on the floor of the Crystal Palace yeah, dressing yeah, room. Yeah, yeah before Monday's Championship playoff second leg at the Amex Stadium. Ian Holloway and Gus Poy were the managers, I think. Gus Poy at the Brighton manager wanted to get to the bottom of it. So he wrote an email to the staff. So uh, the incident prompted a furious email to staff from the Brighton manager, Gus Poy. He says, hello everyone. <laughs> For some reason, that is still not clear to me, says Gus Poy, someone during the day had access to the away dressing room and done something terrible. Trying to upset everyone at Palace. And then just to be clear about things, he says, to say it in clear English, someone had a poo. <laughs> <laughs> what an email to get. Everybody at Brighton.com. Uh, someone had a poo all outside the toilets, over and around the toilets. I am angry that someone within this club would endanger our good reputation and stoop so low. Did they imagine this would affect Crystal Palace? <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> well, possibly it did. It may have fired them up. Well, somebody made a very bad decision. <laughs> And I think it's time to stand up and take responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely a serious derby. I remember that. There was oh, big, dear. big rumours. That was the Crystal Palace bus driver. Oh, you can't, uh, we can't libel anyone here on air, can we? Big, big rumours. Uh, well, falsified rumours. Well, we don't know. Well, we don't it's know. Show. The Crystal Palace <laughs> bus driver shot in the own, his own team dressing room. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Where is this show gone? Allegedly, this show? allegedly, not the case. Well, Gus Boyd seemed to think it was someone in the Brighton camp okay. that went across the room into the. I'll Crystal do a Palace. bit more digging on that and see if I can find that Crystal Palace bus driver. Well, can we get him on the phone? I should have asked Reedy about <laughs> next week. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I mean, if you're talking derbies, yeah, that's right, it, isn't Brighton it? That's Crystal the, Palace is hard the to peak. Beat. Yeah. Peak. All right. I think we've gone about fourteen minutes over. Okay. Uh, Pleasure. Thanks. Flew yeah. again as usual. Uh, we've had some good, nice chat to really. Got through a few little bits and bobs. Uh, that's all we got time for, unfortunately. As per usual, download it from the usual place. Watch it back on YouTube. Until next week, we shall see you then.